when your cooking makes people say, what is that flavor? How did you do that? What, why is that so good? Well, you'll just be able to smile <laughs> because you know the difference between fair and fantastic cooking means getting as much flavor into your soups and sauces, your steamed and poached items as you can. And to do that, you gotta be sneaky tasty. And I'm gonna show you how today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cook's Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cook's Code, everyone. This is the weekly show for the methods, the techniques, and the insights into your better food and cooking. We're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. You don't want to miss any of them. But if you did, uh, then you can go to my video archive on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash chef.todd.more slash videos. And there's the weekly schedule as well. Uh, Monday, uh, sorry, Tuesdays, uh, Carefree Cooks Codes, uh, Thursday and Saturday, Casual Cooking. Normally on Wednesdays, the first and third Wednesday of every Every month we have a study hall for those of you that are lifetime members of web cooking classes I'll tell you that the study hall will be canceled for tomorrow so let me just tell you that for now no study hall tomorrow oh and also if you want to see what I'm cooking when we're not live and how I did it you can go ahead and follow chef Todd Moore on Instagram as well this is shrimp avocado tomato tostadas uh, so see how I did it over there on Instagram. How do we do it? Well, we're carefree cooks. Uh, we create our own recipes. It winds up bringing friends and family together because we learn every time we cook. And you wind up creating your own cooking style because you practice pro methods and you wind up loving your cooking. That's really how the Carefree Cooks journey works. And it's great to be back together again, everyone. We're starting another year of taking the necessary steps to break the Carefree Cooks code. Now, what does that mean? How do you break the Carefree Cooks Code? What you do is you gather all the skills, all the insights you can, all the methods behind cooking, and you use them to cook freely with confidence and creativity and applying it to any ingredient for any diet or any desire. Sounds complicated, but it's ridiculously easy. It comes down to practicing your methods and having these skills. And this is why I'm so dedicated to sharing them with you. And that's why we're chasing down the Carefree Cooks Code together because it unlocks just so much fun in the kitchen. The Carefree Cooks Code, not the finish of the journey because you may never finish. I got news for you. I'm still working on it, you know? But the journey itself, it, it just... In the process of taking this journey, you generate pride in your cooking, and that's what we want to do for you. Make you happy and proud of what you're cooking. Uh, we're going to get to all of this, but first, I've got a true or false for you this week. Please tell me in the comment section below if this statement is true or false. The statement is, once something has been defrosted, it cannot be refrozen. True or false in the comment section below. I'll tell you at the end the answer to that one. <clears throat> and I'll bet you at least 50% of you will get it wrong. Uh, look, I've only got, uh, speaking of, 50 more Tuesdays. Two gone, 50 left in this year to share as much information as possible. Uh, and when I think about 50 classes, that I've only got 50 classes to help bring your cooking to the point that you want it to be. Not, not me, I don't decide on your journey. You decide on your journey. So taking your cooking to the point you want it to be, hey, 50 classes might seem like a lot, you know? You might think you'd know everything, but just think about how quickly last year went by, right? 50 goes by quickly. So 
A lot of times I sit and I think to myself, how, how can I bring the biggest impact to your cooking in the shortest amount of time? If I've only got 50 classes, I better pick them correctly. So my mission this week, how do I add more flavor to your cooking so that you really can impress yourself and the people that you cook with? And to me, or for, <laughs> for that matter, to me, the answer is being sneaky tasty. Now, I'll, I'll tell you what this means to me. It, sneaky tasty. W once you're confident in how to cook, once you have your methods down, you can repeat them over and over again. It doesn't matter what you're cooking. You're confident in how to cook, right? Basic, dependable, repeatable methods. That's probably lesson one in the Carefree Cook's journey. But once you're confident in how to cook, then it's time to get sneaky. And then it's time to get sneaky with your flavors. And the best way to get sneaky is to start creating your own flavorful liquids your own stocks and broths, your own compound butters, macerating one flavor into the other. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do today. This, making your own stocks and broths, this is the way to get the deepest, richest, most authentic flavor in your cooking. It doesn't compare to a bouillon cube, okay? So sometimes time is tight and you don't have a chicken carcass laying around. <laughs> or you're vegetarian and you don't use bouillon cubes in the first place. But when you make your own flavorful liquids in the kitchen, changes your cooking entirely. So let's go over some definitions first, as I like to. Uh, remember, a stock is really just a flavored liquid. Now, with small changes, but there's only really three kinds of stock either, and this makes it so easy. Simple definition, simple range of things. But the key to a good stock, the key to a good sauce, the key to a good soup, the key to a good braised dish is the stock, is the original flavor. A good stock adds flavor to your steamed items, your poached items, your simmered items. The people that keep frozen Ziploc bags of stock in their freezer are the ones that have some of the best flavor in their foods. Now, there are several types of stock, but they're all made from the same four ingredients. So you can make just about every stock in the world with all four of these ingredients or only three. And they are bones, vegetables, mirepoix, liquids, and seasonings. It's that easy. Only four ingredients, like so much of cooking. I gotta editorialize for a minute. What? <laughs> Why do people make it seem so hard? The, the people on TV, the cookbooks, they want you to think this is hard and it's not hard. There's only four ingredients and only three kinds of stock. And all you got to do is put water on top of them and pretty much walk away. How could this be difficult? How could this be like a highfalutin culinary thing that people think they can't do? You can do this because each stock uses a, a specific procedure to get the distinctive characteristics out of it. So let's go over a few of them. A white stock. Now, a lot of people don't even know there's a white stock. And this comes from simmering chicken or veal or even beef bones in water with vegetables and seasoning. There's our four ingredients. But the stock remains relatively colorless during the cooking process. Nothing has been caramelized. Nothing's been toasted in this. This is raw chicken bones. After you clean things, raw veal bones, beef bones, pork bones, any of those things. And the best bones for like a white chicken stock without caramelization are the bones from the back and the neck. These are the bones that are highest in collagen. And this is why it's a lot more difficult to make like a chicken stock from wings, just like a bunch of chicken wings. They're little tiny bones, you know, even the legs and thighs. You, you, you just, you, you don't make as good a stock because of the lack of collagen. And it's also the reason that you don't make a stock from chicken meat. You can't just put chicken breast in water and call it a stock. Now, a white stock, you can alter the color of a white stock, with different colors of mirepoix. So if you use more carrots than onion or celery, you'll get a brighter stock. More celery uh, will give you a little greener stock, more onions, a whiter stock. Or if you add onion skins, they impart a darker color to a white stock. So you can get the flavor of a white stock and a little bit more of the color of a brown stock by putting onion skins in it. But for a really white stock, 
Change your mirepoix entirely. Do a mirepoix of like uh, parsnips, mushrooms, and leeks, right? Three things. Instead of carrot, onion, celery, which is traditional mirepoix, uh, try three things that are white. Mushrooms, parsnips, and leeks, and you get a really nice white stock. Uh, the next one is a brown stock. Now, a brown stock is, again, it doesn't have to just be beef. People think a brown stock has to be beef. A brown stock can be chicken, can be veal, can be pork, can be game, right? Venison or things like that. Again, with vegetables, water, and seasoning. <clears throat> but the difference is that the bones are caramelized. And even the mirepoix can be caramelized. Before you simmer everything, it all gets toasted in the oven to a nice brown color, cooled a little bit, and then start it in cold water with your seasonings. This stock is going to give you a much richer, much darker color. The browned bones and also a, a lot of times tomato paste. Tomato paste is added to a brown stock. It's a, it's a, a French culinary thing called emise. Emmy say you, you wipe tomato paste onto the bones, you cover things in, in, in this acid, which is also gonna help like tenderize and give a little bit of flavor to the stock as well. Now the best bones for a dark stock, for like a beef stock or a pork stock, something like that, or, or, or a veal stock are the bones of younger animals. Younger animals have a higher percentage of cartilage and connective tissue. And connective tissue is high in collagen. Collagen is the protein that dissolves when it's cooked in moisture. Collagen is converted to gelatin and water, okay? Whew! <laughs> I know that was a lot. This is culinary school class, okay? So let me get that to you again. In the bones, there is collagen. Collagen is the thing when it's cooked in moisture turns to gelatin. Gelatin is the thing that makes your stock jiggly jiggly. So this is why you can't make a stock just out of a chicken breast. You need the collagen in the bone. And the gelatin is tasteless. It's odorless. Um, it's jelly-like substance, right? And it's a thickener. It gives richness. It gives body to your stock way better than just like a broth or a dissolved bouillon cube. And once again, the best veal and beef bones and so on for the stock are the ones highest in collagen, back bones, uh, neck bones, shank bones down the leg, they're highest in collagen content. Uh, if you're gonna do a beef stock, it's usually best, you don't wanna do a Fred Flintstone stock, put a gigantic cow femur. It, no, they, they need to be cut into like two to three inch pieces so that you get more surface area, they release as much flavor as possible, they get as much collagen into that liquid as possible. Okay. Let's go to vegetable stock and why this is a little bit of a misnomer. I told you white stock, brown stock, we're talking about bones of animals. We're talking about collagen cooked in moisture becomes gelatin, which is the jelly-like thickener. Well, th there's no collagen <laughs> in vegetables. There's no bones in vegetables. So vegetable stocks are always gonna be a lot thinner than protein-based stocks. And the key here, since it's a vegetable stock, is choosing the vegetables. You know, in your broth, in your uh, uh, protein-based stocks, the mirepoix within reason doesn't matter that much. A vegetable stock, the mirepoix is what it's about. So many of the ingredients that you put in this vegetable stock are going to contribute to the color and flavor to it. It's it's the main ingredient. I um, <laughs> Years ago, I was saving broccoli stems uh, for the longest time. I didn't know what I was gonna do with them. And when I had too many broccoli stems, I decided I would make a stock. Well, I think the only time I could use this stock would have been on St. Patty's Day. <laughs> it was nothing but green. It glowed like it was radioactive. There needs to be a balance in making a vegetable stock. And I'm not, I'm not going to review all the steps for stock making today. Uh, web Cooking Classes members go to lesson week 11 and you get all, the, all, all you need on creating flavorful liquids. But today, what I really want to do, given that background, is to give you some new ideas into being sneaky tasty with your flavors because flavorful liquids, they go way beyond protein stocks. They go way beyond just chicken, beef, and vegetables. You, you could start to think of something like a fish stock. Slowly simmer fish bones or crustacean shells with vegetable seasonings and liquid, right? Without coloring them, without browning them. If you were with me on Saturday for shrimp bisque, 
That's what we did. We made a quickie stock out of the shrimp shells. And the best bones for fish are from lean white fish. Lean white fish, flounder, tilapia, fluke, turbo, things like that. Bones from very fatty fish, tuna, salmon, swordfish, shark, things like that. They do not make very good stock because of the high fat content, um, very distinctive flavor, uh, and very oily as well. You'll, you, you, if you try and make a salmon bone stock, you'll get something pretty oily and pretty fishy uh, tasting. Uh, fish carcasses, by the way, uh, they should be cut into pieces. Anytime you're going to make a stock, increase the surface area as best as you can. Wash everything of blood and, in, and impurities. But here's how you take this one step deeper. So if you can take shrimp shells or lobster shells or crayfish shells or fish bones, anything like that, you can make a fish fumé. Now a fumé is really a quickie quickie stock because what you do is you take uh, wine and lemon juice along with that fish stock and it kind of, it calms down that fish flavor a little bit. The, the lemon flavor, the wine, you're adding a heavy acid to it. So fish stock and fish fumé are both pretty strongly flavored, right? Relatively colorless, but fish fumé is not drank, right? You don't make a soup out of fish fumé. It's a poaching liquid. Um, it's not a sauce either because it's a very highly acidic sauce. You've got all that lemon and all that wine in a fish flavored sauce. Fish fumé is a fantastic way to steam your shrimp lemon slices and herbs and so on in that steaming liquid, uh, basically you're making a fumé to steam your shrimp. Great idea for your shrimp cocktail. Uh, the next is called court bouillon or court, court bouillon. Uh, this one is made by simmering vegetables and seasonings in water. And again, acids, heavily acid, like a vinegar or wine. But here's the difference. You get a lot of herbs. Save all your dill stems, save all your, your fresh basil stems, save the ends of things, and you can make a fish, I'm sorry, an herb fumé. So the cord bouillon is really used for poaching fish, poaching vegetables. It is really a very, very aromatic tea that you use for poaching other food. So if you have a really large uh, basil harvest in your garden this spring, if you have thyme, everybody knows thyme and rosemary, they'll just take over your garden. E even the hard stalks can be simmered in liquid and you can make a court bouillon from it. Um, take it a step further, you can simmer it in alcohol uh, for a while, some vodka or even some rubbing alcohol and make perfume, right? You can go that far, but it's, I'm getting off track here telling you how to make perfume. It's sneaky tasty, right? It, it's the idea of getting one flavor into another. So if you steam shrimp, make a really flavorful fumé first. If you're going to do salmon, make a really rich dill court bouillon first, and you'll be surprised how much flavor you get into your food. So from there, that's kind of the realm of cooking liquids. That's stocks, fumé, and court bouillon. But you could start thinking about infusing flavors into any liquid. So let me give you some more ideas for getting sneaky tasty with some other flavorful liquids. You take the principles of stock making and you can create compound flavors in other liquids like milk, right? I, I teach in web cooking classes, uh, we teach about uh, macerating milk with onion pique. Onion pique, uh, and sometimes garlic, is an onion, half an onion, with a bay leaf and, and a bunch of cloves. Again, web cooking classes members, lesson week 12, you learn about this onion pique, which flavors the milk, which then becomes your sauce, right? What well, if you were making an orange dish? What if you wanted to do like orange chicken? And you started by simmering your ginger in some orange juice. Make yourself some orange ginger, then use that in your stir fry or your wok, right? Um, similarly, what if you want a spicy soy sauce for your sauteed fish? How about simmering uh, some wasabi powder or just plain old horseradish or red pepper flakes in your soy sauce first, strain that stuff out, now you've made a compound flavor for your condiments as well. Flavor your ketchup, flavor your mayonnaise, flavor your soy sauce and your Worcestershire sauce to do something really unique. Like I said, how about a dill court bouillon 
for salmon. One of my favorite things to do. Tons of dill stems, lemon slices, poached salmon in it, right? You can simmer lemon peels in white wine and use that to make a shrimp scampi. You could create a jalapeno uh, court bouillon. Jalapeno chicken court bouillon for uh, poaching chicken for your next burrito dish. I don't know. I'm just making it up. You know, th this, is, this is what carefree cooking is about. Think about new ways to use these methods to influ infuse one flavor into another. You could even think about double flavoring. You could think about double stocking items. Um, if you simmer whole grain mustard in, in beef stock, you get a whole new compound flavor, like a mustard beef stock. And also whole grain mustard is a thickening agent. It has thickening powers, so it can change the texture as well. Um, you could caramelize onions and, and simmer them in your chicken stock, right? For even greater complexity of flavors. Saute the onions in bacon grease, bacon fat, strain all that out, and then put the sauteed onions in your stock and see if you get an onion bacon flavor out of it, right? You get it? Double stocking means taking your stock and reducing it even further, and this sends you down the path of demi-glace. Demi-glace is a drastically reduced concentra concentration of stock. So what you do is you take one gallon of stock, you let it simmer all day long, and it winds up to a one cup of glaze. It is a 16 time reduction. I used to do this all the time in the commercial kitchen. Five gallons of beef broth left to simmer very low in a steam jacket kettle overnight comes down to, uh, I don't know, a quart maybe, but it will then flavor and thicken other gallons that way. Uh, you could go to demi-glace. Demi-glace is equal parts brown stock and brown sauce Okay, make yourself a good brown stock by caramelizing beef bones, simmering it, so on and so forth. Again, lesson week 11. Make yourself a brown sauce, espanol, let's say, lesson week 12. Combine the two of them and then reduce that by half, and you've got a demi-glace. It, it's, you know, it's endless when you start thinking about one flavor on top of the other and how you can be sneaky tasty. These are all just ideas. These are ideas for using the methods of stock making and translating them into just a general idea of infusing your own flavors into liquid. So I started out saying you got to make your own stocks. Okay, it'd be great if you did. But did you just get an idea of flavoring your ketchup? Flavoring your soy sauce? Flavoring the liquid that you steam things in? This gives an entire new dimension to everything, to your sauces to your braised items, to your poached, steamed, simmered items, because when you start to hide one flavor within another, you are being really sneaky tasty. That's the idea. And you have accomplished, ah, you have accomplished this tremendous success of having people say, how did you do that? What is that great flavor that I can't identify? Can you do that again? And when you get to that level of success, ah, you can just sit back and relax in a nice warm bath. All right, that's creepy. Um, all right, let's move on. Uh, look, I know, I know it's not always possible to make your own stocks and broths. They, they do take time, but they don't take time like stir fry does. They don't take time like saute does. You set them and you kind of forget them. It is one of the times I might even bring myself to recommend a lazy cook. Oh, what do they call those? Crock pots. That's right. Uh, one of those times it might actually be good for a lazy cooker because you can set that stock all day long and it goes. So as you gather the bones, the, the shells, the, the onion skins, the ends of celery, the other random bits of food that everyone else would throw away, you will know that that garbage, what would have been garbage to anyone else, is the makings of a flavorful liquid that's going to take your next soup, sauce, steamed item, poached item, from fair to fantastic. Uh, let's see who in our Carefree Cooks community, our private Facebook community of lifetime members of web cooking classes, let's see who's being sneaky tasty this week. 
Carol starts us off. She got the lesson about building compound flavors into her soup. She followed the true bisque method that I showed on Saturday. She made this great shrimp bisque, getting the most flavor out of those shells as possible. Uh, Karen, Karen grew up inland, Australia, um, so not too confident <laughs> with, with seafood, but when you have a dependable method, then you can turn shrimp bisque into prawn bisque. Oh, what? Oh, that's the same thing? Oh, all right, never mind. Uh, <laughs> okay, hey, good job, Karen, by the way. Roberta uh, says she made her best cheese sauce ever. Uh, I love when people are really proud of what they've done. Uh, Clifford went for the bechamel sauce also. He says he thinks he's finally mastered it. He's making the one that is perfect for his family, right? So he has a basic sauce for his family, not too thick, not too thin, just right. And in the commercial kitchen, I think we would call this the Goldilocks sauce. Just right. <laughs> Teresa took the Ziploc bag of shrimp shells that she had been saving and simmered them softly. She saved shrimp shells and simmered them softly. And she made this really sneaky, tasty compound shrimp butter. God, look at that. That's gorgeous. Just imagine the shrimp flavor in that butty butter. Teresa, um, go ahead and make an omelet with shrimp butter. You will flip. Ah, flip. Omelet. Good one. Hey, look, this week, uh, while you're cooking, I want you to think about being sneaky tasty. I, I want you to think about how you can get one flavor inside another. Stocks and broths, fats and compound butters, macerating milks. This is all great ways to be sneaky with your flavors and impress your diners even more. Uh, let's get back to the true or false today. If you defor defrost something, can you refreeze it? Once something is defrosted, you cannot refreeze it. True or false? No, the statement is false. <laughs> yeah, if you defrost something, you can certainly refreeze it with one caveat you have to keep it out of the temperature danger zone. So this is why you don't defrost something at room temperature on your kitchen counter overnight. If you defrost something from freezer to refrigerator and it stays below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, four degrees Celsius, absolutely you can turn around and free freeze it. I do it all the time. I, I freeze a pound of ground beef. I defrost it cut half a pound off, re-wrap, uh, re and then freeze the other half a pound. You can refreeze things, but they can never get above 40 or four. Hey, look, if you know someone whose cooking is just way too obvious, you know, no, no depth of flavor, why don't you help them be sneaky tasty as well? Please like, love, share this video with your friends so their cooking can go from fair to fantastic as well. And if you'd like to start your own culinary journey and be able to cook any ingredient for any diet or any desire, uh, you really don't need to be sneaky about that. All you got to do is get my free guidebook. It's the five forks to carefree cooking. I'll show you the way. Uh, go to fiveforksguide.com to download your free copy right now. So until next Tuesday, when we again work toward breaking this carefree cook's code, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's always a method to your sneaky cooking success. Bye, everyone.